I want to talk about understanding uh, the causal structure in an emergent geometry. Uh, so this is uh, based on work over the last couple of years, but in particular this paper from uh, September with three collaborators at no, 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 no. Uh, uh, so, so when we say causality in quantum field theory, we know exactly what that means. Uh, it just means that local operators on the propagate inside the light cone, so the commutator vanishes in space-like separation. <laughs> And this completely characterizes uh, what we mean by a causal quantum field theory. Uh, better than that, it's implied by the usual things that we use to characterize quantum field theory, uh, unitarity or Euclidean language reflection positivity. In a fluctuating geometry, gravity, uh, the situation is a lot more subtle. Uh, even the rules are really Basically, basically unknown. unknown. Even, Even if we just, if we just talk about the S matrix in a quantum field theory without, without gravity, uh, exactly, exactly what the rules are for causality are not known. Uh, with gravity, it's worse, worse because the regions, regions and the light cones depend on geometry. geometry. Uh, we, don't uh, we don't understand what energy, energy conditions we're allowed, allowed to impose. The answer, the answer uh, whatever, whatever it is, has to be very subtle. subtle. Because, because uh, we can't, we can't throw, throw out locality, causality, causality completely, completely, but on the other, but on the other hand, we need to allow information to escape from black holes, uh, which, uh, which is in some sense uh, uh, violating causality, causality according, according to the usual pictures we draw of a black hole. <laughs> but we can't just throw away everything. There are other rules uh, that, that seem to, seem to be uh, absolute, absolute, rules that you can't, can't violate non even non-perturbatively. The statement, the statement that there are no traversable wormholes, wormholes seems to be required, no CTCs, uh, and, in and in particular, uh, causality, causality uh, at infinity. So if you send, you send a signal from infinity, infinity lands back, back at infinity, uh, that, seems, uh, that, to that seems to be a statement that's viable, uh, or, or, or rather a condition that you can't, you can't have a causality violation at infinity, uh, even, uh, even non perturbatively <coughs> So, so ADS-CFT, ADS that's, the, that's, the, that's clearest, the clearest, uh, simplest, uh, simplest statement of causality. Uh, the one that, uh, the we, one know that we know must be true of causality, causality in the dual CFT, CFT is causality uh, at infinity, boundary, boundary causality. Uh, and, uh, and one way to think about this is to send is something, something into ADS, ADS boundary. From boundary. Uh, uh, this, this is asymptotically ADS, ADS but it's some excited state and if you send, if you send it a probe, probe, it'll experience some time delay at delta t uh, by the time it gets back to the boundary. And that time delay had better be positive. So this is a signal uh, that went in from the CFT, from the local operator in the CFT, it went into the bulk, it eventually hit the boundary again, and the causality in the CFT tells us that time delay has to be uh, not negative. So, so uh, the, the, what, I what I want to describe in this talk uh, is, uh, is to understand this causal structure for the CFT. I'm going to succeed only perturbatively near the vacuum state uh, or perturbatively in an expansion near the boundary. So, so uh, when I talk about propagating, propagating deep into the bulk, uh, I'm restricting, restricting to states that are just basically uh, linearized excitations of the ADS vacuum. The way, the way the structure works, works uh, is, related is related to the chaos bound, bound and QNAC, and other interesting constraints. So first, so first what is the main point? point? So, so let me state the, the main result. The main result. Uh, here's, uh, here's the setup. The setup. It's slightly, it's slightly different, different from what I just drew. drew. Okay, so, okay, so I, what I just drew on the previous, previous slide was a time delay of a physical probe. You send something in and there's a time delay. Now, this, now is, this not is not a physical probe. This is a space-like space like geodesic. Uh, it connects two points on the boundary, x1 and x2. We're considering, We're considering the space-time space to be some linearized excitation above the ADS vacuum. And the main result uh, is a statement about this space-like geodesic length. So define delta L to be the length of the geodesic with the vacuum subtracted. So this is finite. And uh, then there's the main result, that uh, the expectation value of this operator viewed as an operator in the CFT. So this is a length, this is something that's calculated in terms of the bulk metric, but can be viewed as a CFT operator. The statement is that this length is positive 
uh, in these states perturbatively excited about the vacuum. Yes. Um, this is space like. Um, that's right. There'll be a two point function in some excited state. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so, by unitarity, I mean unitarity um, in the CFT uh, or reflection positivity, they're the same. Eventually, I'm going to express this delta L using a sum rule in terms of manifestly positive CFT data, squares of things. Okay, so that's the statement. It's a statement about uh, these space like lengths and uh, that perturbations can only increase these space like lengths. So how is this related to what I said a minute ago about time delays? Well, actually, it's the same. It's the same as what I said a minute ago because we're working perturbatively around the vacuum. Uh, and perturbatively around the vacuum, this delta L is proportional to the Shapiro time delay uh, because you can calculate this change in, in geodesic length uh, by, by just, uh, just perturbatively. And it's the same quantity. It's the integral over the null, over the, uh, null ray from here to here of uh, the null null components of the bulk metric. This delta L is for a space like geodesic, but what I'm saying is that it's up to this factor of one over epsilon, uh, which was a, the, the deviation from being null, uh, this, the actual value of this deviation of the space like length is equal to the time delay you would compute in this other experiment where you send a physical probe. Both of these are real numbers, but they're different, they're different real numbers. One is this time delay in the physical experiment, and the other is the geodesic length in the space-like probe. So uh, this Shapiro time delay is something that's been studied uh, in various contexts. Uh, in particular, Engelhardt and, Sh and Pichetti uh, showed that this condition, uh, that this quantity is, is greater than zero is necessary and sufficient for boundary causality. What I'm going to show is that this inequality is completely equivalent to the chaos bound. In fact, this inequality is the chaos bound uh, stated uh, in terms of the bulk operators. So why did I go through this thing of, of uh, rephrasing the Shapiro time delay in terms of a space like geodesic length, the, the answer is, that is, is because to actually derive this, we have to think of it in the space-like sense. What we actually derive requires uh, using positivity properties that apply to the space-like experiment with a space-like length that wouldn't work uh, in this setup where things are time-like separated. So in order to apply the chaos bound, we need to be in a certain regime of some correlation function and interpretation as the space-like length is crucial. So the chaos bound is really uh, related directly to the, to the space-like calculation, not to the time-like one. Yeah? Mr. Kaifa, the condition is for any space-like geodesic that's near in our No, this is a limit as epsilon has to be small. It's the leading term. So when you take epsilon small, you'll find a term that's 1 over epsilon times the Shapiro time delay. And it's that term. It's just that leading term at small epsilon that needs to be positive. But then doesn't it always just not go to antipodal, near antipodal, not the ones that we need? You can't do biological sizes. I think not preservative. It, perturbatively, this is enough. So this is sort of what, what Ned and Sebastian showed. Non-perturbatively, it's not clear. OK, so uh, I, I won't talk too much about the derivation, because I don't have too much time. But I want to explain how this fits into a zoo of constraints uh, coming from various directions and uh, various work by various people. So 
Uh, first of all, there's the average null energy condition. So the annex states that the integral of t is just plain positive. This is true in any state in any quantum field theory. This was proved from relative entropy, uh, and we proved it from the OPE in a way that I'll describe. Now, in a conformal field theory, there's a consequence of the annex that was derived by Hoffman and Malasena. Uh, and these are the conformal collider bounds. These are constraints on the stress tensor three-point couplings. TTT has several coefficients, several OPE coefficients in a conformal field theory. And uh, what they did is they evaluated the null energy operator in some specially designed states constructed from stress tensor insertions. So they took this, they evaluated it in a special state, and used that to derive constraints on the OPE couplings. So the point here is that uh, there are two different ideas here, and they're, and they're related, but they're different. So there's, on the one hand, there's a positive operator, and on the other hand, uh, if you evaluate that positive operator in a cleverly designed state, uh, you can derive uh, constraints on OPE coefficients, inequalities on the OPE coefficients. Now, uh, there's a separate result that started uh, in the bulk with, with, a, with a paper of uh, Kamenho, Edelstein, Madison, and Zhibliev, where they used causality in the bulk, scattering off of a shock wave, uh, to argue that the constraints in a large N theory, so if this is holographic, uh, then you can do this bulk scattering experiment in a holographic theory, the constraints are actually much, much stronger. Instead of getting inequalities on the stress tensor three-point couplings, uh, you fix them uniquely up to just one number. In gravity language, this is a statement that higher derivative terms, including the Gauss-Binet coupling, uh, have to be set to zero up to corrections at the string scale. So this is like a large N strengthening of the conformal collider bounds that came uh, first from these uh, gravitational uh, experiments in the bulk and has later been understood from conformal correlators. So uh, this business with the length operator that I want to describe here uh, is filling in the last, it's, it's answering a natural question that, that's left by, by these three boxes here, which is what is the positive operator that's responsible uh, for these constraints on the graviton three-point couplings. Now, in, in a general field theory, not large n, you have the positive operator and you evaluate it in a special state and you get the collider bounds. So what this suggests is that in a large n theory, there should be some new operator and that operator should be, the positivity of that operator, you uh, should then be a special case of that is that you should evaluate that operator in some specially designed state and get these very strong constraints on uh, the three-point couplings. So the answer to that question is this length, this space-like uh, delta length operator uh, that I just described. So that is the operator which you should evaluate in special states to, to show that uh, alpha Gaspinet is zero or A equals C or these other constraints on the stress tensor couplings. Once you have this one, uh, then you can get back the others in various limits. Now this one requires large n, uh, but in large n theories, it's stronger than all of the other three constraints. So if the theory is large n, you can take a light cone limit and get this. Uh, you can take a light cone limit, evaluate in a special state and get this, or you can evaluate in a special state and go here. So this is sort of the more primitive of the constraints. So let me briefly sketch the derivation. I'll start with the ANEC. So to derive the ANEC, uh, we study a conformal four-point function, uh, which you can think of as a two-point function in some excited state created an by an operator psi. So we study this two-point function in a light cone limit where you take uh, the operators O to be uh, null separated. And as you take them null separated, the operator algebra simpl simplifies and it turns out that the leading contribution to the OPE is exactly uh, the, the, besides the identity, is exactly the null energy operator. So this positivity condition comes from the fact that uh, as you take two operators like, like separated, you can just replace them by the null energy integrated over the, over, by the uh, TUU integrated over the null line connecting them. 
Then there's some other steps that I won't describe. Um, basically, you use analyticity or causality of the correlator to, come, to cook up a sum rule relating uh, this term here uh, in the four-point function to something that's manifestly positive by reflection positivity and um, then end up with a constraint on that leading term in the correlator. Um, the exact assumptions. Okay, so this is true in the light cone limit. Uh, this is, well, I haven't, I haven't written all the, co there are various other terms that come in here. Um, in general, you can write the contribution of the stress tensor that's leading in the light cone limit, and there'll be a kernel inside the integral here, which I haven't written, uh, but as you take these points to be far apart in this direction, that kernel just becomes one, and you get the null energy operator. This is for CFT. Uh, in writing this equation, I've assumed that there are no uh, very light scalar operators whose twist is lower than the twist of the stress tensor, but that's actually not necessary for the argument. They can be projected out. But this, so this is general in CFT. So that was the ANEC. So the, in the ANEC, you take these operators light like separated, you find the null energy operator, dominates some correlator in such a way that it has to come in with, uh, with a certain sign. Uh, the, this argument for the length operator is very similar, except that we take the regge limit. So the regge limit is a limit where these uh, simultaneously get far away and, uh, and null separate. You basically boost them. Uh, this causes the interesting physics in the bulk to happen deep inside instead of happening near the boundary. And in this limit, we derived a similar operator product formula which says that OO is one plus uh, this delta length operator. This one, there are some more assumptions going into this. Okay, so uh, let's see um, if I can list them all. Uh, one is that this is true only for uh, certain types of operators. They have to either be heavy, so very massive fields, uh, or you have to use wave packets. If, they have, if they're light operators, this formula is still true, but only, if, only with some smearing of the operator. The other new assumptions in this case are uh, large n and that there's a large gap in the operator spectrum. So where does this come in? This is important uh, because when you do the OPE in the reg A limit, in a general CFT, uh, you can just get crazy contributions to the, to the OPE. Uh, you, it's, it's not under any control whatsoever, and we have no idea how to use uh, OPEs to understand this limit in a small n CFT. So what large N does for you is it gives you control over the, over the uh, OPE so that you can still use operator products even though you're in this, uh, even though you're in this funny limit. The argument in this case uh, is exactly the chaos, is exactly the argument of the chaos bound where you think of this Rindler space as, as a thermal system. So this is exactly uh, chaos. Let me point out that both of, both of these Arguments are perturbative, although in a different way. So in the reg A limit, the perturbative expansion parameter is 1 over n. That's what we're using to control uh, this calculation. In the ANEC case, the perturbative expansion parameter is kinematic. It's this limit uh, that, that the operators become light-like. So that's how you control the calculation, and that's why you don't need large n. I've been calling this L an operator, uh, so let me just explain briefly what I mean by that. Uh, this is an integral of the bulk metric perturbation, but you can view the bulk metric perturbation as an operator in the CFT, uh, for example, using these HKLL formulas that smear them uh, over some region in the boundary. So in CFT language, the constraint I'm really talking about here involves some smearing of the stress tensor. So the integral over over u is the integral over the geodesic in the bulk, over the null line in the, in the bulk, and this is the smearing. This is the HKLL smearing. There's a crucial factor of i here, and uh, that's crucial because if that i weren't there, then this would just be a consequence of the ANEC. This would just be some, some averaged version of the ANEC. But because of that i, uh, there are negative contributions to this sum, 
This won't be a positive operator in a general theory. There are also multi-trace terms, which I don't have time to go into, uh, but to make a long story short, you can uh, smear them away and ignore them if you're careful about what states you use uh, to evaluate this, uh, this operator. So there are some states where these multi-traces don't contribute, and then you, in those states you just literally have a constraint on this particular uh, strange smeared stress tensor. Okay, so back to the zoo of constraints. So this is the, this is the, the, the derivation of the constraint on, on the length operator. And as I said, once we have that constraint, we can get back to all the other ones. Uh, the one on the bottom row here uh, that gives you the uniqueness of the Einstein gravity three-point couplings uh, just comes from taking this length operator. So in this case, I literally mean that smeared, I, I literally mean this, this expression here. So you take this funny smeared stress tensor and you evaluate it in a state uh, created by stress tensor wave packets and that gives you back all the constraints of CAMS on the Gaspinet coupling and the other couplings of the stress tensor three-point numbers. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is the connection to uh, information. So, the ANEC was first derived not by this OPE method that I just described. It was first derived by uh, this group using monotonicity of relative entropy. The way that argument goes uh, is they take, uh, they take space and they divide it in two and then deform uh, in a light-like direction at the cut here. And then monotonicity of relative entropy implies this inequality implies this monotonicity of the modular Hamiltonian of region A under the null deformation. They calculated that modular Hamiltonian and uh, found that it's given exactly by this, by this null energy operator. So then monotonicity uh, is precisely the ANEC in this situation. It's monotonicity where you deform um, a, a, a spatial region just by pushing it up a tiny bit along uh, one particular null ray. So there's a transverse direction here that isn't drawn, and you're just pushing it up along one of those null rays. So I think a natural question raised by this uh, length operator uh, calculation is whether there's an information theoretic uh, origin of these stronger constraints that you get in holographic theories. So this will give you the conformal collider bounds, but we know that in large N theories, the actual bounds on the stress sensor coupling uh, couplings are these much stronger ones. So is there an information theoretic reason that, uh, that large N theories have these uh, stronger constraints? So is there such a, an argument? Well, maybe. It depends what you mean exactly. I'll tell you to the, the extent to which I understand. I don't, I don't think I exactly know the answer to this question, but I'll tell you uh, what I know. So if you take the length operator, you can rewrite it using Einstein's equations as an integral of some matter flux in the bulk. So uh, if, if this was our, our, our probe geodesic, then you can rewrite the depth length operator as some matter flux through the null surface N uh, that's drawn here. And that matter flux uh, is exactly the, uh, that, sorry, that flux of matter energy through there is exactly this uh, formula of uh, Faulkner, Lee, Parikar, and Wang now applied to the bulk. So that flux of stress energy through this null surface is the, uh, is the shift in the, is the change in the bulk modular Hamiltonian under a deformation of the bulk region. So let me describe what this deformation is. This is pushing my artistic limits, but okay, so here, here's, um, region A and its complement, and uh, we have some, so there's some corresponding, so region A on the boundary, there's a corresponding region A in the bulk, uh, and the deformation that you get uh, when you interpret it this way, the bulk deformation is one that looks like this. Okay, so you have some region in the bulk, and then you push it up a little bit in the bulk. But you do it in such a way that there's no way of interpreting this as a deformation of the boundary region. There is no deformation of, of the CFT. There is no geometric deformation of the CFT 
that results in, in this uh, funny deformation of the bulk because this is no longer an extremal surface. It's locally extremal, uh, but at the tip there, there's a source uh, that means it's really not uh, an extremal surface. So uh, this can't be interpret, interpreted as, as a deformation of the CFT. On the other hand, we do have this information, information theoretic interpretation in terms of the bulk matter. You could still ask uh, why this thing is monotonic from a CFT point of view. So this is monotonic from a bulk effective field theory point of view, but uh, it's not obvious from a CFT point of view. One way to answer that, or one possibility, I don't know if this is the right one, but a possibility is to interpret this as uh, evidence for a gen slight generalization of the JLMS formula for the bulk modular Hamiltonian, or for the CFT modular Hamiltonian, rather. Uh, so what they said was that the modular Hamiltonian is given by the area plus the bulk modular Hamiltonian. And this applied to extremal surfaces, because this is the area of some Rutakanagi surface, or HRT surface, and the uh, matter modular Hamiltonian uh, inside that, the enclosed region. So what this suggests is that maybe this is also true for these near extremal surfaces. If the bulk modular, if the modular Hamiltonian, if the JLMS formula uh, still holds for these deformed regions, then uh, the monotonicity of this CFT quantity uh, will be exactly the monotonicity of the bulk matter modular Hamiltonian. The area terms will cancel, and you'll just be left with monotonicity in the bulk. So this is. Uh, perhaps the explanation, although I think understanding uh, to what extent we can really make sense of regions in the bulk when they're not bounded by extremal surfaces is, uh, is an important uh, open question. Let me draw some conclusions on this spatial slice of ADS here, uh, so I'll be brief. The, point, uh, the points that I made are, first of all, that uh, Causality in the, in the light-like limit, which is causality in a limit where probes hug the boundary, gives you the average null energy condition. Secondly, that uh, probes that go deep into the bulk, these are probes that are pushed into the reg limit in CFT language, uh, gives you this constraint on the length operator, viewed as an operator uh, in the CFT. I should also mention the Q-neck. Uh, on this picture, I'm not, I didn't talk about the Q-neck, but on this picture, the Q-neck is a statement about causality uh, of, uh, in a more local sense in the bulk. So we take this uh, boundary-hugging geodesic and just look at propagation from here to here. And uh, in, as, as Aaron talked about, um, there are various proofs of the Q-neck. One uses this. Uh, this propagation along that tiny segment to prove it. Uh, so that one does not come, that one, since it's local, it does not come from this length operator. Uh, the length operator ties together some of these more uh, non-local things that don't involve the entropy uh, in the statement of the inequality. I think there are lots of, there are lots more questions we could ask along these lines. Uh, in particular, the ones that I just talked about are all perturbative, either in the near boundary expansion or perturbative above ADS. And so I think there's a lot of information here that hasn't been mined. In fact, or in particular, there's, a, there's all of the constraints on matter energy in the bulk. And those constraints on the positivity of matter energy in the bulk has really not been, has not been used yet. So I think there's still a lot of information to be extracted here. Uh, and stronger current constraints to be uh, understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Some questions? Okay. Daniel? Do I understand correctly that the, the region in which you, you smear these operators on the boundary for a length operator is three linear vectors stacked up on the boundary because the HKLL construction maps you back in time? 
Um, so it's accessing stuff in the past and the future of where. So we're we're using the complexified ball version of HKLL. Okay. So when you integrate, so you have a bulk metric perturbation integrated over this null geodesic. You push that to the boundary, and then you integrate over a complexified ball in that boundary region. So that's the region that we end up okay. having this operator smeared over. But but if you did go back to the Lorentz signature, then then it would be what I said. I think we would run into trouble if we did it that way, because I think we would probably lose our positivity conditions that went into the derivation, although I'm not entirely sure. Okay, so let, let me just try to ask a little bit again the thing I asked before. So if, if, I, I don't know the, the general regime of validity of this statement, but certainly in the vacuum and thermal field double and some other states, the two point <coughs> of boundary operators is computed by a geodesic plane. Yes. Um, so doesn't this statement of yours put constraints on two point functions, at least in those kind of states? That's exactly what this is. It's a constraint on the two point function in states that are perturbative above the vacuum. Um, but but that, but why are you talking? I don't. But then why are you talking about the chaos bound? I thought this that what I, I mean the two point function is just a two point function. It's a chaos bound in the sense of Rindler space. I mean, it's if you think of the if you think of the perturbation as being created by another operator, then this is a four point function in Rindler space. Oh, like in some state, like like it's a two point function in a state that you. Created. It's a two point function in a state, so that's a four point function in Rindler space. And that's the right time ordering to for the chaos. Yes. Bound? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Can you say a few more words about the choice of the state side you uh, made to get rid of the multi-trace operator contribution of delta delta L? Yeah, so, um, in general, when you calculate these, when you calculate this four-point function, you're supposed to calculate a Witten diagram. And a Witten diagram has contributions not only from stress sensor exchange, but also from double trace exchanges of the external operators. Um, so in order to get rid of those contributions, we had to go to essentially go to momentum, insert momentum space wave packets of the external operators. And um, it's the same wave packet that Hoffman and Malasena used. I think one way to think about it is that the using wave packets for the external operators sort of causes those operators to travel on geodesics. And then instead of getting Witten diagrams, you get geodesic Witten diagrams. Geodesic Witten diagrams don't have contributions from the double traces. So this is a way of getting rid of them. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we thank Thomas again. Thank you.